Well, good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting of 2018 of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee. May I ask everyone present to turn electrical devices to silent. And uh, turning to the agenda, item one is a decision by the committee to take items four, five, six and seven in private. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. Now, today we uh, continue our consideration of the uh, possibility of a publicly owned energy company, and we have witnesses uh, today. Uh, first of all, Peter Spears, Public Affairs Manager of Scottish Renewables, then Alistair Steele, who's the chair of Our Power Energy Supply. Next, uh, Gail Scholes, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Robin Hood Energy. And finally, Nicholas Gubbins, Chief Executive of Community Energy Scotland. So welcome to all four of you and thank you for coming in today. We'll start off with <coughs> pardon me, questions from committee member Andy Whiteman. Thank you, convener, and welcome <coughs> along today. The whole concept of a publicly owned energy company at one level seems to have been plucked out of thin air and no one really knows what the point of it is and why we would do it. Um, is there anything intrinsic in having an energy company that's owned by the public? that would provide benefits for Scotland and its energy supply generation and use. If, if you want to just indicate by raising your hand that you'd like to come in, and also the, the sound system is operated by the sound desk, so no need to press any buttons. So who would like to um, perhaps start on that one? Just an introductory comment, really. I think from our perspective, Community Energy Scotland's perspective, we're, it's quite striking how uh, undemocratic the energy system is in the UK. Uh, and given the way in which it's changing, um, for example, the rollout of smart, smart technologies and so on, we think there is a huge opportunity for it to become much more democratised, which we think would be a good thing, um, much higher level of engagement and so on. It's difficult to see that happening through the existing uh, setup of very large privately controlled companies with very limited or very low levels of uh, democratic accountability. So, that's really just our perspective from a position of the sort of democratisation of the energy system. And Peter Spears, I think, wanted to come in. Yes, yeah, so from, from our perspective, the, we viewed the company uh, less as a company and more as, a, as an agency, um, certainly with the potential to, to act as an agency rather than um, merely in a, a narrow sense as a company. And for us, that would present an opportunity to behave uh, a bit more like some other countries, like perhaps Denmark or Sweden, and to uh, have embedded within the government uh, um, an organisation that is uh, committed, from our perspective, to ensuring maximum uh, renewable uh, generation supply. Um, so for, for us, uh, as I say, we, we attempted to, to view it as more of, of potentially an agency that, than just as a company. Gail Shaws. Hi, Robin Hood Energy, and uh, we are a publicly owned organisation. So we've now been trading for three years. We were set up publicly owned, uh, not for profit. So we are completely sort of transparent and accountable for, uh, for, for being an energy supplier. But what it has meant is that um, we've been able to sort of join up on lots of other strategies. So climate change strategy, um, fuel poverty strategy in particular. And with 183,000 households in extreme fuel poverty in Scotland, it's a, it's a real way into connecting with communities and other agencies that are um, publicly owned or uh, governed, you know, citizens' advice, for instance. Um, but, the, but there's lots of agencies that you can connect up with. So we've, we've now grown to some... Um, we've got over 200,000 metre supply points... Um, I believe that, you know, certainly in terms of the sticky customers and the customers who have never switched, probably, who are on the most expensive tariffs, this is a, this is a really good way into, into that customer group and, and trying to operate at community level. 
And Alistair Steele. Um, from our power point of view, we were uh, set up by Scottish housing providers, so we're, uh, our model is a, a community benefit society. We are owned and, and controlled by our member organisations. Um, and looking at it from the supply side and uh, the, the company entering the supply market, um, that we probably see that as a, it has to be really clear in what it's trying to achieve. Um, and, and if the market is not working and you're looking to intervene in the market, is coming in as a, as a company, you know, um, entering into that, the right thing to do, or are there other ways you could intervene to have, um, you know, sort of create the, or address the, the problems that you're, you, you've identified. So I think from, from our point of view, in terms of an energy supply company, it's a really um, uh, dynamic marketplace. It's a very competitive marketplace just now. There's a lot of risks involved in entering that marketplace as, as a company. So I, I would maybe question whether it's, it's the right thing for government to be doing it just now in terms of a, a, a new publicly owned uh, energy company. <coughs> I think in terms of the broader system where you're looking at generation, you're looking at the, the networks and distribution, and you're looking at the supply side, um, it's how that, that supply chain works, and is there anybody been disadvantaged in that supply chain? And there's certainly parts of the, the country are. Um, north of Scotland is, is um, one of the areas where the, the, the transmission and distribution charges are for electricity are higher than in the south of Scotland. So people in an area that are off the gas supply are, are paying more for their electricity than, the, the, than other areas. And that's a major uh, contributor to fuel poverty. So there's issues like that within the wider system that, that I, I think are, are public. Um, whether it's an agency or whether it's a company, I think, as a new point, I think it's maybe more an agency could begin to address those things rather than actually setting up a company to enter into the market directly. So that's very useful. I mean, we, it seems we're, we're starting with what we've been, been given, which is the proposition that there should be a public loan energy company. Mm -hmm. We're not starting with how do we tackle fuel poverty, support community energy, um, et cetera. So uh, I just wondered, um, Nic Nicholas Gubbins, I, I agree that the energy uh, industry is very undemocratic. Um, one way to democratise the energy um, <clears throat> sector would be to have many, many more municipal energy companies and social enterprises. Um, so if you, you comment on that. Um, uh, Peter, you represent, I think, some publicly owned energy companies. I mean, Vattenfall is a member, it's a publicly owned energy company. And essentially what you're saying is you don't see the Scottish Public Loan Energy Company as a Scottish Vattenfall, you see it as a Danish energy agency. Uh, if you just clarify that. And also, is Robin Hood a social enterprise or is it a company with no share capital? I just wonder if you can talk about some of the governance issues around Robin Hood. Thank you. Right, so Peter Spears and then Gail Scholes. Yes, so uh, the, we see it as, as a, something that, that could act as both. Um, if, if the Scottish Government wants to proceed with it as acting um, as a supplier um, and, and behaving much like that and fell, then, then that's something that it could do. But, but for us, the greatest opportunity is for acting in a more agency-like uh, manner. So for us, it could be both. But what we're trying to, to, to push is, is an agenda that sees it, uh, if it does behave as a supplier, uh, that, it, that it can also act um, in, a, in a broader sense within, within government. And Gail Scholes. Okay, so um, so Nottingham City Council um, own Robin Hood Energy, so they're the only shareholder, um, and it's 100% owned um, by the by um, by the City Council. We also have a number of white labels. So we have currently nine white label organisations that we've set up in in their own right. So Liverpool Lecky and Ram Energy and Your Sussex, for example, and uh, and Ebico. And Ebico, they, they, they also have a charitable trust um, set up as part of those arrangements. So, um, so but predominantly, it's 100% a, it's a owned by Nottingham City Council. So, so it's a municipal energy company? Yeah. Conventionally? Yeah. <coughs> Shall I move? Yeah. Um, uh, Nicholas uh, Gobbins. Sorry, yeah. Um, the, the question from Andy was um, about the uh, sort of de uh, d democratic nature of municipal energy companies and potential for social you know, many more social enterprises and so on. 
Um, I think we, we're coming to this from a position, it's almost like we need to move to a position where the consumer is a very informed consumer and ideally an engaged consumer. So mechanisms which engage the consumer much more in the, uh, the sources and the use of the power that they're receiving to us are very important. So the question then is, what's the best way of doing that? And in our view, the more local and the more ownership stake those consumers, or we prefer the term citizens, have, then the better the whole system will be. So um, we see there's tremendous scope to increase that engagement, whether it's through uh, the sort of hierarchy of uh, uh, organizations a bit like Gail has described um, or through larger scale municipal s setups we, we're sort of entirely open on what that might be as long as there's much greater opportunities for engagement of citizens in the way the system is run which for us is critical the only other thing I'd say is that it's clear that economies of scale are central to the, sort of the financially viable operation of energy, of any energy supply company, um, which has to be you know, a massive factor in the way an actual supply company would operate. Okay, thank you. We're slightly um, constrained for time this morning, so um, perhaps okay. I would like to move on now to Colin Beattie. Yeah. Simple question that we've sort of you've sort of been bouncing around: Should this proposed company be involved directly? in the supply of energy, or should it be taking a much more strategic role? Peter Spears. Yes, so uh, from our perspective, the opportunity that, that lies with this, uh, this whole endeavour um, is, is less to do with direct supply, where the margins are quite small and where it's a relatively crowded market. Um, and with uh, assisting in ensuring that the Scottish Government can achieve, and the UK Government can achieve, the uh, quite ambitious renewables and climate change targets that they have. So uh, one proposal that we have is for the company to aggregate uh, public sector demand and ensure that it is purchased directly from renewable sources. So that could either be uh, government-owned um, uh, generation or it could be through PPAs directly with existing companies. Uh, the existing companies have a pretty good track record of of achieving uh, scale and reliability. So obviously we've got 69% of uh, Scotland's electricity being generated through renewable sources already. So um, if the <coughs> government could aggregate that demand, uh, enter into PPAs, particularly with something like uh, onshore wind, which is currently locked out of the contract for difference mechanism by the UK government, it could certainly provide um, a, at least a bridge to a future CFD uh, decision or um, set up a high level of uh, bespoke uh, additional capacity over and above what would be provided by CFD. So I think the opportunity is there for the uh, company to directly involve itself or to directly support generation uh, at large scale, uh, but also at small scale as well. So with the, the changes to the feed-in tariff that have been proposed uh, by the UK government, there is uh, an opportunity to provide support for uh, community level uh, generation that could replicate in some way the success of the, the feed-in tariff in Scotland. But it seems to me you're proposing something that's fairly limited in scope for the for this proposed company. I mean, we're talking about, uh, well, you're talking about uh, really uh, consolidation of uh, public sector uh, purchasing capability mm. so that uh, simply by bringing it all together you can negotiate a better price. Is that really the role this company should have? I, I think it is a role that the company definitely could have. Um, if it was directly involved in supply, uh, then you, you add the, the supply demand uh, that it requires to, to public sector demand. And I think you could end up with a, a fairly substantial amount of, um, yeah, of, of demand for 
uh, both electricity and heat. Uh, I mean, that might give uh, uh, slightly cheaper uh, power power to the uh, to the public sector. It's not going to alleviate fuel poverty or anything like that, or it's not going to have a significant impact on that, which is part of the purpose of this company. Well, I mean, on onshore wind is the cheapest form of new electricity generation. Offshore wind and um, solar PV are also very uh, low cost. There's a, a di obviously a direct relationship between the, the cost of, of generation and uh, the, the end bill. So it certainly would have a downward effect on, on bills for consumers, both the government and for, for individual consumers. Well, that's for steel and then Gail Strolls. Yeah. Um, to answer the question, I think we, we said in our submission that we, we didn't think the public wind energy supply company should be involved directly in su supply. Um, I think when you, you look at the market just now and, and what it could add to the market, um, th there's a very active switching market out there for consumers that are engaged, that pay by direct debit, manage their, their energy online. Um, so if it's been set up specifically to deal with uh, people that are disadvantaged within the energy market, particularly those in fuel poverty, um, we know from our experience, because our power was set up specifically with that, that aim in mind, um, and we entered the market with um, you know, prepayment, one tariff, no matter uh, whether you're in prepayment, direct debit, paying and bill, we embraced the warm homes discount from day one and we, t we took on these things. But it's actually very difficult to get people that are not engaged in the energy sector to switch. So I think um, the idea that a new company could come in to the market and begin to make that big impact in fuel poverty, I, I don't see the evidence from that in, in the work that's been done to date because it's actually accessing that, that body of consumers that are disengaged is, is, is very, very difficult. I, I think in terms of, of um, what's happening in the energy market, um, the energy market is going to go through huge change in the next few years and, and it's going to move away from suppliers charging people in kilowatt hours to much more uh, holistic energy services model where within a home people are, are perhaps generating because they've got solar on roof, there's storage within the home as well. So the way that the energy market works and the way that companies deal with consumers is, is going to be different in 10 years' time than it is today. And the real um, challenge in that, I think, is that the people that are disadvantaged in the current market will be even more disadvantaged in that market. So how can you make sure that nobody's left behind in that energy transition? So I think if, if, if there's going to be a, an agency or a company set up, it's much more looking at what's, going to, what's the change that's going to happen in the energy sector and how can we ensure that Scotland you know, sort of benefits from that change and nobody's left behind. And part of that will be what's the role of local authorities in that as well, because they, I think they've got a, a, a real role to play in that. But to answer your question, I, I don't think they should be involved in directly <coughs> in the supply side. Thing. And Gail Scholes, I think, wanted to come in and comment on this, and then we'll move to questions from Gordon MacDonald. Gail Scholes. So, so I agree. I think that um, not in, in terms of directly being involved in supply, but I do think you're right in terms of all of that needs to be joined up. Because if we don't join it up, then we're missing a real trick in terms of, you know, the amount of new homes that have to be built, electric charging points, battery storage, linking all of that up to renewable tariffs in the future. So the market is definitely going to change. And, and so it does need some kind of thought and some vision to sort of bring that all together. And that's why I strongly believe that that is the role of a publicly owned body. If you think about local authorities, they're generally uh, the working at city, the working at region level. Um, they are bringing together all of the, the climate change objectives, um, the goals around fuel poverty, um, the rollout of renewables. They're also the planning authority. Um, they're generally linked to new housing developments. So the role can be significant if you get the model right. And, uh, and I think that, you know, you could do both really by entering into something, you know, like a, a white label arrangement um, initially, but still having, you know, those really close ties to local authorities being connected into that model. Thank you. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, in relation to supporting the growth of uh, community and local energy uh, generation, is there scope for a publicly owned energy company to support um, small community owned generators through power purchase agreements. Nicholas Govins. 
Thank you. The, the, the big issue just now is that the wave of community-owned uh, uh, generation projects has sort of passed by, <laughs> and um, the financials are uh, just not there to make it viable, um, largely. Uh, uh, and, that's, um, and that's reflecting the point that, that many of the community energy projects in, uh, engage a great deal of voluntary effort as, mm. as well. And so there has to be something very worthwhile to, to justify the huge amount of effort that goes into making these projects happen. So, so could uh, uh, a, an energy supply company or even a publicly owned energy supply company make a difference in offering, um, in, in the way that they're offering P of PPAs to uh, sort of facilitate new generation, make that happen? Um, we have sort of thought through several possible models. The, the key thing is to have know, uh, both a combination of capital up front and uh, a revenue stream that will enable a project to be financed. Um, to be absolutely honest, we can't see how, a, how the public element of an energy supply company could actually make much difference for various legal reasons. I mean, they're not going to be able to offer much better PPAs than probably the market mm. is currently the case. But what they potentially could offer, but then any other energy supply company could possibly offer this too, would be a, a different way in which the fin finances are structured. So uh, there could be scope for, for example, um, uh, investing in community energy projects mm. up front and then having a discounted um, supply in other words, the community project itself would be discounting its supply to mm. that supplier through perhaps a PPA mm -hmm. over a period of years. So that would give both the supplier a long-term security of supply, which is obviously a critical thing in the wholesale market variations that we currently have, but it also would give the community, uh, <coughs> the community generator mm. uh, sort of a potentially viable financial framework to make it all worthwhile. But I go back to the point that could ha that could potentially happen now with mm -hmm. with you know suppliers who are interested in, in that model, and I'm not sure how much difference a, a publicly owned body would make, other than the fact that policy. You, you've mentioned um, that the financials had changed. What has changed is the UK government's announcement that the feeding tariffs are changing, or, or, or what? Well, the feeding tariff has been going down significantly, and obviously onshore wind is mm. for, for any significant projects is no longer there anyway. Mm. But um, the removal of the export tariff now, uh, highly likely from the end of March next mm. year, basically is the it pretty much signals the end of support to small scale relatively small scale projects from then on onwards. There's been a great deal of uh, talk about subsidy free renewables, which may be feasible at a very large scale, but for small projects which don't have that advantage of economies of scale, it's not going to work. The only way that we can see through that is for there to be much more collective uh, scale development, which could be linked to municipal developments, or it could be uh, you know, a large-scale collective engagement of lots of different community groups across Scotland mm -hmm. wishing to take forward projects. But there has to be economies of scale somehow in that to make the financials uh, anywhere viable. Okay. And they also want to comment on that? Yeah. Um, so I, I think the points that Nicholas made are, are, are accurate, but I, I think that the difference that a publicly owned energy company could make is... is as Nicholas mentioned, the political will to, to do it. I mean, the, the Scottish government's energy strategy notes the the benefits of community uh, and decentralised uh, generation for it being closer to where um, uh, the energy is required and uh, making the, the system more flexible. The the whole direction of travel of the Scottish energy um, system is toward that increasingly decentralised model. So I think. The, the, the financials may be difficult from the perspective of the private sector, but from the perspective of the Scottish Government, with those advantages uh, recognised uh, and seen as increasingly important, 
to the Scottish Government. I think uh, the political will could exist to provide the, the sort of support that's required for community uh, level generation. In terms of any new um, community generation, uh, there obviously has to be grid connections and there's been a suggestion that the, the, any new company should focus on those areas where there are grid constraints. What difference could a, a company make uh, with these grid constraints? Um, Nicholas Gubbins. The, the key really to overcoming the issue of grid constraints, which basically means that no new project yeah. can connect on yeah. to the system, is, is through uh, maximising the use of the various innovation measures that are now starting to appear, and which we ourselves have been closely involved with. So is that where, where there is high-level constraint, it actually creates real opportunities for using power in different ways. Mm. So, for example, substituting, rather than simply connecting new power to the grid, using it to substitute for heating oil or for transport, you know, current fossil fuel use in transport. So the key thing there is having the will to explore, to pilot and to test the ways in which power can be linked directly on the existing infrastructure to local usage. So rather, so, so say you, you had a new, a new generating plant came on, it would have to have certainty in knowing that any power that it, it pumps out uh, is, is going to be used and is going to be saleable. Uh, it, currently in constrained areas, it can't do that because at best it might get a non what's called a non-firm connection. At worst, it won't get any connection. So it needs to have a whole body of demand locally that it which would be new demand than it's currently there, mm -hmm. that, that can be switched on to take that power whenever it's generating. That's now proved to be technically feasible to do. It's actually a question of will in investment in those local energy systems to make that happen and to create the financially viable models that will then elicit new generation schemes specifically targeted at new local demands. Uh, at the moment, that's only happening in a very small way but there's tremendous scope to increase that, particularly in the constrained areas, which then would unlock you know, what remains very significant potential for renewable energy generation in those areas. Thank you. Okay. And Alistair Steele wants to come in on that, and then we'll come to Jackie okay. Bailey. <coughs> Just on the PPA market, um, our power has got a, a number of PPAs with community generators just now, and, and that's a, a very active market. You know, they tend to go out to the market annually or, or however long the agreement's for and almost re-tender that at the time. So there is a market that's working uh, at the moment, so it, there has to be maybe some care in intervening in that market. If the Scottish Government was coming in with a, a different offer in PPAs, how would that impact on the market that's there just now? And, and the danger is it could actually push up um, costs. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, Gail touched on the, the plethora of different initiatives um, designed to tackle some problem or other within the energy market, and we could reel off a list. I understand there's at least 36 different schemes. Um, so I'm curious to know what the, other, the, the rest of the panel think about whether a publicly owned energy company actually will simplify that, or will it potentially add more complexity to the process? I'll start with Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. That's very kind of you. Um, the, the proposals are still at such an embryonic stage that it, it entirely depends on what the government wants, uh, how act, the, the, the company actually looks. Um, if, it, if it's, it has the opportunity, I think, to take in these schemes and um, improve on them, consolidate them. I mean, an obvious example is heat policy. Um, at the moment, uh, there's the LHE scheme that's that's uh, been proposed. Now, we are a bit concerned that the, there's been a bit of uh, watering down of proposals from the Scottish Government on renewable heat, and, and the biggest issue is a lack of long-term uh, pipeline of, of activity for companies and uh, for the industry to actually engage in. Um, uh, so... The opportunity exists there for the publicly owned energy company to assist local authorities in their LHE's work and to build on it. Um, so that, that could certainly um, 
I think, consolidate and improve upon uh, an intervention that currently exists. If it sits just as, what was it 36, you said? Mm. It was just a 37th intervention, then obviously it, 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 probably, it wouldn't uh, necessarily simplify things. But if it, if it could take that system-wide approach and seek to consolidate and, and improve on what's, what's there, then the opportunities there, it just depends on what the precise proposal is. Alistair? Yeah, I think it would it would have to be able to simplify it or there wouldn't be any point in doing it. You know, so actually if it was coming into the market and just adding in a, a, another layer or complexity to it, then I, th I think it would fail in what it's trying to do. Um, I think coming into the market, it's, it's going to be difficult to simplify just the way the market's structured just now um, because you, you get quite a complex supply chain and within that supply chain there's a whole number of profit centres. Uh, within it. You've got a, a UK-wide regulatory regime um, and as we've heard, there's a grid and, and uh, uh, distribution and, and, and transmission uh, costs within that as well um, are, are something that really needs to be tackled. You know, mm -hmm. that I think they were um, developed for a, another era when there was centralised power generation. They don't really reflect how um, energy is generated anymore. So there's big things like that that need to be um, you know, challenged, but they're, they're more at a UK level rather than, a, than a, at a Scottish level. So it's the ability of a, a Scottish public energy company to really make that, that intervention and, and make the changes that's needed. Okay. I don't know if there's a view from, I've already got Gail's view, I think, mm. in response to an <laughs> earlier question. I don't know if Nicholas Govins has a view. Yes, I, I think uh, I, I really struggle to see how uh, uh, a publicly owned supply company would add value. Um, um, it's almost <coughs> like a, uh, the way the market <coughs> operates at the moment, it would be a sort of almost like a contradiction in terms that you could have a public supply company, publicly owned supply company anyway. Um, so it's, it is a question of what all the other things that potentially could be done that could be very useful. And there are other things out there. At the moment, they're sort of dealt with in lots of different bits of the Scottish Government or, and the ancillary bodies and agencies and so on. And whilst it generally works, perhaps it could work a lot better if all those other bits and pieces were brought together and coordinated. So there is merit there, I think. OK. Um, can I then follow up with... if? Whatever form this publicly owned energy company takes, um, do you think it should be independent of government? Um, is there a way of doing that? Or do you th and, and it acts as a policy advisor? Or does, by merit of it being publicly owned, mean that it has to sit within government? Personally, if it was doing all the other stuff other than supply, I think there would be a real advantage in being publicly owned, governmental, it has the weight and the policy influence and so on of a government body or agency. I don't think that would apply if it was a supply company. It would have to be independent. Okay. Alistair, I see you nodding. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I think Gail's um, example shows that you, you can have uh, publicly owned energy companies, but I think that's it's more at a, a local authority level where there's... Uh, maybe a reference to a local energy market, but those companies have to operate it with that area to become financially viable. So that's one of the you know the contradictions in, in that model, but it's, it's a real um, issue for the sector. Um, so I, I, I think in, 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 in many ways it's... Um, it, yeah, I think what Nicholas said is, is, is absolutely right. I think there, there is a, for a national energy agency, you could see that, and you could see in terms of how the economy is going to develop, um, about all these things are very smart meters, storage systems, you know. There's a lot of Scottish companies at the, the, the leading edge in, in developing some of those. You know, how can you invest in, in, in those companies so that when the transition comes through, it's really creating local jobs in, in Scotland become, can become a real driver in that. I think there'd be opportunities there in linking what a, an energy agency could do to, to the employment side as well. But on the supply side, I think, you know, it's more the local. Yeah. OK. Thank you, convener. John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, I mean, Gordon MacDonald could have touched on the whole area of community generation and maybe the new company could kind of amalgamate or be a guaranteed purchaser or something like that. But, I mean, what about the new company actually doing any generation itself 
uh, is that feasible? I mean, I'm, I'm not clear if uh, Our Power or Robin Hood do any generation, or if you, if you purely buy, and if not, why not? And uh, is that a, f a possibility? We, we buy rather than generate. It was in our initial um, vision that we would be generating our own electricity. Um, uh, really, it's, um, I suppose, the complexities of running a supply business and the capital that's needed to um, enter the, the generation site is precluded as doing that. So maybe in the, the longer term, uh, we'd like to have much more control over the supply chain. But certainly where we are in our development has been too difficult, I think, a task for us to, to achieve that in the, the two years that we've been operating. I think if um, a public owned energy company was entering the, the generation uh, market, um, then it, it would be again faced with some of the challenges that other generators are providing and, and getting a financial model that, that works, you know, given that there's no feed-in tariffs and there's a, a capital investment and there's a revenue coming in from that investment and these two have to balance, and, and it's how you would fund that and whether there would be state aid issues if, if other companies could be doing it. So uh, I think it's something that could be looking at ways to support the generation industry rather than entering it directly. I would but, because in your submission, I think you said uh, we should maybe nationalise some existing assets. So what were you thinking of, buying some hydro schemes? or? Um, I, I, if, I was thinking more of the infrastructure um, grid. I, I would think is one of the areas um, where I, I, we were thinking more of that because um, talking about the grid constraints, some of the, the interconnect investment and in interconnectors from the islands, some of the grid constraints in the mainland, um, those are areas where if, if, if that infrastructure was working better and had more capacity in it, then it would re release a lot of potential in other areas, including renewables. Okay. Ms Scholes, did you want to kind of come in? I suppose it's just where it's financially viable to do so. And um, at, at, at this point, we've only just turned profit this year. So, and it was only a small amount. So we, we've invested in warm home discount. But as soon as we get to, to any kind of scale of, of profit, then we'd be looking to invest in having our own um, generation. Certainly things like private wire, um, you know, investing in community energy projects. So they're, they're the types of things that we would kind of naturally go to. Mm -hmm. And what about, I mean, district heating, for example, is that something yeah. you would look at? Because, I mean, certainly, I don't know Nottingham, but Glasgow, it's very patchy, there's little bits. But yeah. um, is that an area that you would see in a city that you could move into? Where, where it works, yes. I mean, Nottingham, Nottingham has a, a fairly large-scale um, district heating scheme, and it's, and it's run quite successfully, but it's publicly owned. Uh, which is interesting in itself, because the ones that don't tend to sort of work so well are probably those that are commercially owned, where they um, have financial constraints around um, further investment in pipe networks and um, private wire. And, you know, the, the, they'll only extend out to where it's financially viable and you've got a, you've got a sale at the end of the heat network and you need that sale almost straight away. Whereas I think um, our approach certainly in Nottingham has been to, to make sure that the city is well connected. So when we were putting in a tram network to make sure we had pipe, pipe work underneath the trams um, so that you can connect you know, certain parts of the city in the future. And I think that's where the model has, has worked. So in answer to your question, yes, I think in the future, as long as it's financially viable to do so, then we would invest. Okay, thanks so much. I, mean, I don't know if the other two want to come in. I mean, is there enough generation already so there's no space for the company to go in and do some new generation? On, on, when it comes to, to large scale, you know, work that's already in the planning process on onshore wind could effectively double the capacity of existing onshore wind. Um, when it comes to small scale generation, I think the industry exists there. It just needs uh, support and, and, and clarity. But on the district heat point, I think that's one area where the government really could uh, certainly be a first mover. So in, uh, for quite a lot of, of district heat schemes, um, particularly one that's the first in its area, uh, the borrowing costs are prohibitive for the private sector uh, to, to, to be involved. So as a as an instigator of a, a district heat network, um, doing the, the, the hard work of getting uh, consumers 
to uh, actually want to participate in a, a district heat system and then to have the, the reasonably low borrowing costs associated with government uh, that that could make projects that are currently either unviable or on the, the precipice of being unviable viable and it could uh, certainly be the beginning in, a, in an area like Glasgow where there's, there's, it's very piecemeal. It could establish a pretty significant foothold for the industry in there. The public sector could either continue to expand that out or it could just be the first mover and allow um, industry to, to, to build on uh, from that, that point. So I think on heat, that there's, there is a, an opportunity there. That's helpful. Thank you. With just a quick comment, um, I'm, I'm sure both Alistair and Gail would... Um, not want, want to speak for them in any way, but would be delighted if there was a way in which there was an incentive which enabled them to invest uh, in the acquisition of generation assets, or at least long-term PPA arrangements with uh, local or, or Scottish generation assets, because it's that stabilization of the supply to an energy supplier which is so vital in avoiding the fluctuations in the wholesale market. So. That, that is a, a key requirement if we're going to see um, uh, sort of more democratic energy companies survive. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, Angela Clancy. Uh, thank you, convener. I've got one general question for the panel and one specific question for Ms. Ms. Schools. Um, I'm very conscious that a publicly owned energy company won't operate here in Scotland in isolation, given that uh, energy regulation in the market um, you know, operates at a UK level and uh, beyond. Uh, therefore, I'm interested in the panel's view on the impact of any UK government uh, decisions, either on things like support for renewables, access to the grid, uh, what impact uh, that has on the energy market here in Scotland, but also uh, on a publicly owned energy company. Some examples from our power's point of view, we, we, as I said earlier, we started off with uh, being formed by Scottish housing providers, but we've now moved into the GB market um, because we needed that, that uh, width to be able to become financially viable. I think there's a, in terms of the, the way that the energy market works, the regulator has recently um, intervened in terms of price caps and standard variable tariffs, and before that, price caps and prepayment meters. Um, and that has a significant impact in the market and behaviour of, of suppliers. So there's, and that was a policy-led initiative from, from the UK government. So there's things like that that the regulators bringing in, um, the smart meter timetable um, impacts on, on, on consumers here, and that's again a UK uh, regulatory thing. And we spoke about the feed-in tariffs as well uh, being removed, and again, that's that's a UK-wide issue. So I think it's unavoidable that a Scottish public-owned energy company will be influenced by what's happening at a UK level because that's where the, the energy um, sector is regulated and, and a lot of the policies drivers come from. Ms Schultz? I think that um, <coughs> the problem is that the, the energy industry is, is quite broken in places and um, you know before we even start with anything we, we, we need to do a whole load of fixing of, um, of, of making sure that the energy industry is set up you know for, for the next kind of generation because you know the, the problem is that it was all the en industry code at the moment has been designed around you know six big energy companies and the market is very very different so I think there's there's an awful lot of work to do but I do think that actually the role of being publicly owned is that we, we do get to do an awful lot of lobbying, um, both the regulator and at government level, to make sure that, that some of that is, is now addressed. Because Ofgem's not hearing any lobbying coming from the big six, and they're not hearing it from, from some of the other um, suppliers in the market. It's only really the very small energy suppliers entering into that market that are really struggling with industry code that is is really blocking um, progress. So, um, but but there's lots changing, and uh, and you know since we've we've entered into the market, we've managed to sort of change the or influence the price cap on prepayment tariffs. You know that was something that uh, that that we did, um, and uh, and that was a change for the for the greater good. Okay, thank you. 
Mr. Mr. Gibbons. Um, ju it's just it's a bit of an unusual point, but I had a letter back yesterday from Claire Perry, the minister in uh, energy minister in the UK government. It was in response to a letter that we jointly sent to the prime minister on the state of the UK government's policy to small scale co and community energy <coughs> development. And in her letter, which was uh, 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 a very nice letter and a response and so on, but everything that she documented in it, which r related to the whole sort of community energy sector, actually only related to England. And, and so there is an issue about how uh, little visibility Scotland has in the UK government's energy policy uh, mechanism. But on the other hand, you know, Scotland is entirely subject to the UK energy market and the Ofgem, the regulator, and so on. So there's a sort of a disconnect which needs to be filled in a far better way than is currently the case. So uh, just sort of, it's sort of an illustrative point, really, that there is a need for a much more significant sort of role or measure that would have that impact at a UK level, for as long as we have a UK energy market. Okay. Mr Spears, do you want to add anything before I move on to my next question? Yeah, I think the points that are raised are, are, are pretty spot on, but the uh, point I would raise is that, that there's always going to be a limitation um, to from the, just derived from the powers um, here in Scotland. So I think that the UK government at times views Scotland uh, on, on renewables specifically, as, as, as most of the world does, is doing a, a very good job. And I, th I think their view is that um, they can take a slightly more hands-off approach. Uh, we are trying to change that, but um, yeah, I think there are, there are just inherent limitations to, to the work that the, the company can do. Okay. And my, my final question, convener, is specific to uh, Ms. Ms. Schools. Um, the, the Scottish Government, uh, as you'll be aware, has announced in terms of the publicly owned energy company that uh, they will take a local authority approach, either individually or collectively. It will be phased. Uh, you know, there'll be a white, white label um, arrangement. Um, and I just wanted to be clear on your earlier uh, remarks whether you endorse that approach. And given your uh, great experience in, in Nottingham, uh, what advice uh, you would have for the Scottish Government uh, as they proceed, uh, you know, working in partnership with local authorities? I do endorse that approach because, um, you know, as Alistair's mentioned, the risk of now entering into this, this marketplace. I mean, when we entered the market some three years ago, it was a very different um, different place. You know, there was some 42 small energy companies, there's now over 70 commodity prices this year have risen some 60%. And, um, you know, the, the one thing that we've learned is it, it's the expertise and it's the knowledge um, required to sort of set these um, publicly owned um, companies up. And that's not to be kind of underestimated in terms of how much, how much industry knowledge is required. Um, there's, there's also the risk, there's financial risk um, of entering into the market. Um, some of the smaller energy suppliers have, um, have entered and, and, and quickly departed that market um, because of the price of commodity. Um, so I think that it's a, good, it's a good starting point and it's a transition. You know, so Scotland could take that approach to enter the market much quicker than 2021, which is envisaged at the moment. Um, I think that if you waited until 2021, you'd probably be missing, um, you know, some of the smart meter rollout programs. Um, it, it, the market is going to change in, in the next two years. Um, so I'd probably say that entering into a white label arrangement takes you to the market much quicker, um, less risk, and um, you could still take a longer term view um, in terms of what that transition looks like and what that develops into at a later date. But certainly starting off with, with a white label that you could then engage with other parts of Scotland and other partners um, could work really well for Scotland. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And finally, Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you very much. I'm very conscious of time. So I've just got a, um, a, few, a few very brief questions. Firstly, we talked a lot about um, uh, the kind of the, the reducing prices, but also uh, about supporting community energy and other small-scale kind of energy. Is there not a conflict uh, in those two objectives? Um, how do, without you know, subsidising considerably uh, and putting a lot of time and focus into community energy, which which I support, but 
you know, how do we how do we do that while also trying to reduce cost at the same time? The <coughs> excuse me, the there are clear advantages that have cost implications um, with uh, from from community owned energy. The some of those implications increase the price, some of them decrease the price. So having it closer, to, having the generation closer to, to consumers decreases the price um, of, of transmitting it to them. So I think it's, it's a, a reasonably complex picture uh, in there, but the, the overall advantages of community-owned uh, energy, as, as I know you're aware, um, are, are pretty significant. So uh, I don't think there's... I think the conflicts may be a bit more complicated than than the, the sort of the, the binary there. The wholesale energy costs are about 40% of the cost of running a business. So if, if that cost goes up, then you know it, it has a direct impact on, on the prices because it's, it's, it's such a significant part of what you do. So if, if there is a relationship with community energy, you have to use that in a way to try and bring down some of your other costs in order to, to make uh, avoid price increases. And I think... Uh, what Peter said about the, the transmission side and the distribution side is where you would then want to link that local that generation to local consumption, and if you can manage that, then I think that that's the thing that can make it viable. That that would then rely surely on having a lot more generation closer to the to the the sites of use, the main uses so around the cities, and the oh. like. and is that feasible? Mm -hmm. um, and. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think if, <laughs> if if there was a public-owned energy company that was try trying to join everything up, it may, may very well. But I think it it's uh, looking at the, the holistic thing, so uh, making sure local authorities are people are investing in renewables in, in, in cities, but also in remote areas too, where there's a, a lot of generation, and that generation is bypassing um, you know the consumers in those areas. So I think it would be a, a, a different uh, approach in urban areas than you would want to take in rural areas but I think it is achievable and the challenge is making it happen yeah. so, sorry. you typically have a, about 10 p per kilowatt hour uh, uh, differential between the wholesale uh, value to a community generator of selling their power to the grid and then the retail cost that someone living maybe just nearby would be paying for that energy because it's going off to the grid and coming back again so what that, the, the hidden issue in all of that is the use of system charges, both on the distribution network and the transmission use of system charges, where there's a chunk of the cost. So there's a big debate on those charges and what the fair charging rate should be. And we believe there is scope within that debate to control some of the cost elements and therefore incentivize that local generation and local use um, uh, equation. Um, um, we're not there yet, but there's a very significant uh, point in working out the financials that you're alluding to. And would that, would that, um, would that generation, would that increase in generation require um, government, a Scottish government support? Would it require um, upfront costs to, to get to get that in place? I, I think there are a number of ways that it would benefit from that sort of support, both in terms of. You know, obviously, <laughs> market compliance uh, uh, investment measures, but also in support for the innovation and the network and the changes in the way the network is operated locally to enable that to happen, which I think is going to happen. It just could use a bit of a push. Okay. Right. Um, perhaps the last word to uh, to you, Gail. So where there has been financial incentives, such as the feed-in tariff, it really has accelerated the whole programme of solar. Mm -hmm. And so where you see it works really well is, is kind of where there is a, an incentive <coughs> put in place to, 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 to get scale back into communities. But um, I think as a priority area, you know, off-grid off -grid locations is, uh, is a really good example where that could work really well in terms of cost because generally it's, it's those consumers who are paying the most for, for heat, you know, in terms of oil or diesel or, or whatever mechanism they're having to buy. But at that, that's at a huge cost. And if you look at where fuel poverty <coughs> is, it's generally going to be in some of those off-grid supply areas. So I think there's, you know, there's some obvious places where that would work really well, um, you know, in terms of initial investment. Right. Uh, thank you very much to our panel of witnesses for coming in today. 
I'll now suspend the meeting before we move on to our next uh, evidence session. Thank you. Welcome back to the uh, meeting. We now move on to our consideration of the Damages, Investment, Returns and Periodical Payments Scotland Bill. Um, I'd like to welcome our witnesses today. Uh, first of all, Simon Di Rolo, QC of the Faculty of Advocates. Uh, Gordon DL, Vice President of the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers. Uh, Professor Victoria Wass. Professor of HRM Cardiff Business School and uh, Patrick McGuire, Solicitor Advocate of Thompson Solicitor. So welcome to all four of you this morning and thank you for coming in today. Um, first of all, I should start off by referring to my register of in interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates and uh, I wanted to just uh, deal with one question before we come to other committee members and that's to do with the question of the... Um, the issue of fixing of the um, personal injury discount rate. Now, I think looking at the uh, submissions from the Faculty of Advocates and uh, the uh, Thompson solicitors in particular, uh, at least on the surface, there may seem to be slight, um, slightly different approaches to this. And uh, so a question, first of all, to Mr. Di Rolo before Mr. Maguire may wish to uh, come back and comment on that, or indeed our other two panel members. 
I think the, the issue was raised with regard to the question of the UK government actuary being involved in the, the setting of this rate, and I think the suggestion from uh, Thompson's was that it might be better to have an expert or expert panel. And the faculty's response uh, on this point was that I think general agreement that it was right to remove the issue from the political sphere, but um, just looking at what was said, we understand the government actuary will be able to deliver what is sought. So I'm just wondering whether there is um, a disagreement on that point, or I think the faculty also commented in a lot of other areas that um, experts, expert advice or evidence would need to be referred to. Um, so I don't know if Mr. Di Rolo, you would like to comment on that first or hear what Mr. Maguire has to say on it before doing so. Um, in relation to that particular matter, I think the position for the faculty is that we, insofar as we understand how these things work, thought that the government actually would be able to perform the role adequately. It may be there's room for a different uh, view about that. I, I don't have a particularly strong view on that aspect of the matter. Um, so uh, from what I understand, the role of the government actually and how the government actually operates, it, it seemed to us that the government actually would be able to perform the, the role as proposed. In a, in, and independently of government, as it were, because the government actually is meant to deliver advice uh, I I independently. Thank you. Mr. Maguire, did you want to come in and comment on that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, my, my comments in this section, uh, of course, are secondary and almost kind of esto case to the primary point, which is that, of course, uh, I don't uh, believe that the approach to the investment uh, is correct at all. I think the notion of the cautious investor is wrong. So in many ways, my comments about the government actually is secondary to that. Uh, and if my primary position is accepted, then um, there's no need to go down that road. However, I, I think I've got two points to make. Uh, the first is that um, um, independent of the government or not, it strikes me that the role of the government actually um, is at least quasi-political. And I think when we look at the two parliaments and their approaches to very key issues such as this, but all matters uh, of civil justice over the last decade, there's been a very clear divergence between the two. Uh, and it strikes me that it would therefore be inappropriate uh, and a retrograde step uh, for the uh, Parliament here uh, to be relying on the uh, government actually at Westminster. There's a secondary point, which is the process around uh, how uh, the government actually uh, arrives at a figure and how that can be reviewed uh, as currently drafted. Uh, and the approach that's to be followed uh, in England and Wales uh, is that it will be set uh, and cannot be reviewed by an expert panel for a period of five years. That could very well be far mm. too late. So I think in all these respects, uh, we really should be doing our own thing north of the border. Um, do other members of the panel wish to comment on that, or Mr. Di Rolo again, if you wish to come in? Um, Professor Vass. Yes, thank you. Um, I just perhaps ought to say a few words before I start. That it might, you, you might be wondering what a professor of HRM has, um, got, why they've got an interest in this. Actually, my background is economics. I'm trained as an economist, and actually largely what I teach in university is economics. And I've had um, an interest in damages for an awful, going back an awful long time. Um, I think the politics comes in here in the mix of the portfolio, not in the whatever the government actuaries department is going to do. The, the rate that the government actuaries department will come up with, will the biggest determining factor will be the mix of the portfolio that the ministers have decided upon. So that's where the politics comes in, in the, the portfolio mix. On behalf, of the, on behalf of April, we took the view that actually there was an advantage in the government actually being involved in making the decision because there was a certain independence there and we felt it may be free from political influence. But the point Professor Wallace is absolutely right. Prior to the government actually coming to the decision, there is power for the Scottish ministers to issue regulations setting out, first of all, how the portfolio is uh, comprised um, and secondly, to set the standard adjustment rates mentioned in the proposed legislation. So there is the potential, at least, 
of some significant political influence, and that's something which the committee A ought to be aware of and B consider whether that is appropriate. All right. Um, so it doesn't really matter whether it's the government actually or uh, or, 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 or we go, go along with Patrick. I, I think it's that's not the, it's not. I don't think that's the, the, the important point here. It is what is being said. All right. Well, that's helpful clarification. Uh, Jackie Bailey. Yeah, I we'll explore the detail of that with you. So forgive me if, if I go back and take this um, logically. And let me pursue a couple of aspects of the discount rate with you. Um, first, what pursuers do with any award, um, I think is interesting because my understanding is Wells versus Wells established that you know what a pursuer does with an award is irrelevant. Um, so do you have a view on how pursuers would likely invest their awards, um, and is that remotely relevant to setting the discount rate? Happy to start with whoever wants to go first. Mm -hmm. Professor. Yeah, OK. Um, it's not relevant, um, and I can explain why. Um, I don't know, because I don't have any contact with pursuers after their um, damages have been awarded, um, but what I hear is that they don't invest, uh, largely they don't invest in index-linked government stocks. They invest in risk-bearing assets. But the reason that they invest in risk-bearing assets is the most important thing. They're undercompensated by their award, and they have no choice but to invest in risk-bearing assets in order to make up the shortfall in their award. And I think you'll find, I think at um, 2A of my written submission, I go through four sources of uh, undercompensation. Um, and the first one is that the, the personal injury discount rate from since 2003 um, was always um, above the actual risk-free rate on ILGS. So that was the first shortfall that all um, claimants had to make up. They also have a risk of longevity, and they don't, they don't know when they're going to die. So they, need to, they always feel that they need to keep some back so that they don't run out of their lump sum before, they, before their predicted date of, date of death. So that's another reason why they will invest outside um, ILGS. A lot of what the lump sum will be covering are earnings-based losses. So it might be loss of earnings, but principally it will be care. And care costs go up in... Um, according to earnings inflation rather than price inflation. And the lump sum protects, uh, the ILGS only protects against um, price inflation and earnings inflation up until the last few years, in the last, last 10 years, has always been more than price inflation. So that's another shortfall that they've always been trying to, to make up. And this fourth shortfall is on the accommodation. They don't have enough because of the way the accommodation is, um, is, is compensated to pay for um, adapted accommodation, the accommodation that they need. So they, they, need, they need extra there. So because they're undercompensated in all these different, from all these different sources, if they invested in ILGS, there would be a certain shortfall. And I think that's what drives them to actually take a bet to have a chance of reducing <coughs> that shortfall. Yes, they also take a chance that they might, the shortfall might be, be greater, but the, the, what, what is driving the behaviour that we're observing and that the research in, in this has, has, has observed is the fact that they're undercompensated to start with. Okay. Can I just add to that, that one thing you should always keep in mind when you're considering this issue, that if you settle a case, then you will be buying off a risk of losing or getting less than uh, if you have to litigate. So when you settle, you settle, you, you very often will take a discount for the certainty of getting your award of compensation at a particular, le le particular level. So um, you, there's going to be a discount anyway in terms of any settlement figure uh, in order to avoid going into court. So you, that is, there, there is an inherent amount, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a component of any uh, award which is short of what potentially at least the court would award um, and, and it's a, that is something which a risk averse pursuer who is a stranger to litigation only litigates once um, will, will always buy off that risk or will be advised to buy off that risk by cautious advisors to avoid potentially losing the case or a finding of contributory negligence or getting the um, uh, a lower award than um, uh, is is uh, being proposed because of arguments about the amount of damages. So 
there is inherently in, in the system a, a, a shortfall in any event. And you can add Certainly. that to, to what Victoria is mentioning. Could, could I just divert for a minute and ask, are you saying therefore the system is risk adverse? Well, encourages people to be risk adverse and it, undercompensate. Well, you would, you would, any any person who litigates is going to. It, it's a case of you take your chance if you go into court, and court proceedings are uncertain. You don't know how they're going to to turn out. You don't have. Um, there is always a an element of risk in any court process. The vast majority of procedures who we act for are risk averse. The reason for that is because the fundamental principle we're dealing with here is that of restitution. And that is putting the person who's been injured back in the position they would have been had the accident not happened. So that's to reflect their pain and suffering, their loss of earnings, care costs, and in more serious cases, other heads of claim. Now, for somebody who has suffered that kind of accident, they don't want to be taking any risks having to invest money in the markets. They want to be as certain as they can be that the money will be there to pay for their needs through the, for, for the rest, often for the rest of their life. Um, and that's why I think when you look at past investment behaviour, is on the basis of a discount rate of 2.5%, which was woefully inadequate, hadn't changed for 15 or 16 years. And essentially, you had systemic undercompensation over a large part of, of, of that time. Okay. Patrick? I mean, from my perspective, um, every uh, survivor of a catastrophic injury uh, is different in the approach that they take to the lump sum compensation that they receive, just as every single member of society is different. How you could categorise them, I and I'd agree with Gordon, this is generally very risk adverse, and that's for very obvious reasons. But, uh, you know, I come back to my fundamental point here, and that is I don't think we should be asking how historically uh, survivors of catastrophic, catastrophic injury have invested their money. We should be looking at the most fundamental issue of law of all, and that is how do we ensure that they receive restitution? That is as best as the law permits to put them back in the position they would through financial compensation. And the only way that can be done is when we look at an investment rate that guarantees that rate uh, through no risk investment whatsoever. I, I think we're just looking at it the wrong way otherwise. OK. Um, we, I'm, I'm going to ask you another question that you'll probably be able to, to squeeze in an answer to. Um, it, Contrary to the, the impression I'm getting from the panel, the defenders' representatives would argue that the bill's provisions create overcompensation um, and depart from the principle of 100% compensation. Um, do you think that's going to be the case? And secondly, um, could you maybe kind of, from your perspective, look at how the awards are calculated and what impact um, this could have on the likelihood of overcompensation for the pursuer? Can I just ask you why you think, <laughs> or why it is being said that, um, what's the basis for saying that people are being overcompensated? That's the key question. Of, well, of what, what's the justification? I mean, I, I'm not coming at this from either a pursuer's or a defender's point of view. What I'd like to know is what the evidence for overcompensation is. And I think somebody like Victoria is actually uh, in a, a good position to tell us, actually, um, whether there is any justification for that perspective or not. Indeed, and, and I, we intend when the defenders' representatives yeah. are before us to question them on their assertion too. Mm -hmm. Professor. Yes, um, I think we're all agreed that claimants are risk averse. I mean, it's never been, it's not contended uh, otherwise in the bill. Lord Keane, when he was giving evidence in Westminster um, Select Committee, I was there. He, he, he agreed that um, claimants are risk averse. If they are risk averse, they should face a risk-free investments because they're having to invest their lump sum and take an investment risk all for injury related reasons if they hadn't been injured they wouldn't be in the position where they're having to invest a lump sum in order to generate a cash flow over the rest of their lives so this is a risk that they wouldn't it's entirely injury related and if they're risk averse that means that facing risk imposes a cost on them for if you're going to deliver 100% compensation, you shouldn't um, make them f make them bear a risk when they're risk averse that they wouldn't otherwise have had to face. And in terms of the overcompensation, I can't find any overcompensation pre-bill or post-bill. I've looked for it, um, and so. My advice to this committee is, and unless you're sure that there's some overcompensation there, you should be very careful about signing up to this bill. That's very helpful. 
do. I, I simply don't recognise the concept of overcompensation, uh, and I would echo entirely Victoria's comments. Where is the evidence from the economic, the financial experts, not governments and uh, sorry, government ministers in Westminster? Where is the evidence from those experts that establishes the point? There is none, as far as I can see. Good. As soon as you move away from um, guilt and calculating the discount rate, then you are highly likely to have undercompensation, and there is certainly no question of lower compensation. Okay. Thank you, convener. I suppose uh, if I might just ask a quick question before we go on to John Mason, um, one of the I mean, if we talk about overcompensation, undercompensation, to a certain extent, a court determining an award, looking at um, the length of time the award is meant to cover um, to compensate someone fully, um, is in itself um, doing a best estimate or guesstimate of how long the person will live and so forth. So it, it is true that to a certain extent there is uncertainty about these things in any event, unless one were to go back and review the award over the course of time, is that? It's, it's very uncertain. And going away from guilt just adds to that uncertainty because you're relying on the markets. And to be frank, I'd be surprised if anybody has any firm idea of what the markets are likely to be doing in the foreseeable future. Hmm. But I, I was thinking also the question of how long a person will live, for example, is, is also something that's uncertain if you're looking at that from the point of view it of is very un It is very uncertain. I mean, the, the, the worst type of situation is a parent with a catastrophically injured child who then has to consider um, how long that child will live. Uh, and their concern would be that, um, the, 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 that when, when the parent is no longer able to look after that child, they're, they're no longer able to do so, um, who will do that? they will want to get as much money as possible, obviously, to be able to look after that child for as long as possible. Um, but there is inherently an uncertainty in, this whole, in the whole process. And I think the point that's being made is that if you depart from, from guilts and you require a risk to be taken, then you're just introducing yet another uncertainty. All right, thank you. Uh, John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, I suppose building on what we've already had, I mean, certainly from my perspective, I mean, a, a pension fund, for example, does not put all its money in gilts because it wants a better return, puts it in property, puts it in the stock market, and generally these do better than gilts do. So, I mean, I have to say my assumption is that uh, although there's risk involved, you will get a better return. But, I mean, specifically, one of the things that the bill proposes is, is this further margin of half a percent, and that is a specific one where that it is argued, I'm not saying I'm arguing this, but it is argued that that is overcompensation because we're, we're aiming for this 100% uh, restitution or whatever, then we're throwing in an arbitrary half a percent. Is that half a percent necessary? Is it, is it damage the process, as some are arguing? Can I just ask a question about the pension scheme? Because okay. you, you raised pension okay. schemes. Um, and yes, yeah, sure, if you've got a, a, an immature pension scheme, um, that pension scheme will be at least half invested in equities, I would imagine. But if you're a closed pension scheme, you would be invested almost entirely in ILGS or something very close to it, and that would be a requirement that a closed pension scheme would be invested in, 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 in that sort of portfolio. And the claimant is, is, is just in exactly the same position as a closed pension scheme. They've got a lump sum, they've got nothing further coming in, They've just got a stream of liabilities going out that they have to plan for. Um, so I, uh, a claimant is like a closed pension scheme, and a closed pension scheme would be required to invest in a very, very low-risk portfolio, probably IG ILGS. Okay, that's helpful, yes. Follow that as well uh, and say that, you know, you, you may very well be right. You, it may very well be the case that there might be a better return having a mixed portfolio, investing to some extent in equities. The fundamental question is this, though. Why should we be asking victims of the most serious accidents to do that? That's the most fundamental question we have to address. Why should we force them to do it? Not that if they choose to, they may end up with slightly more money at the end of the day. Why do we force them to do that? Because as best I can tell, the only purpose in this bill, the only purpose in forcing them to do that 
is to benefit shareholders of insurance companies. Is that really what we want to be doing? Well, and presumably the NHS. We're benefiting the NHS if we don't overcompensate. Again, the word overcompensation is being used. The same principle applies. Why should we be forcing victims of the most serious injuries to take that risk? That's the question that I've not heard an answer to I, in any of the consultations. Why do you say forcing? If, if, because you say we shouldn't look at what people actually do, but surely if people are actually doing this already, the, 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 then we're not forcing them, are this, we? The, 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 bill, the bill absolutely... Sorry, one bill, at a time, please. The bill absolutely... If this comes to pass, this bill will absolutely force every single victim of serious accidents, of serious disease, to invest in equities. That's exactly what this bill does. We will okay. be forcing them to take a risk. Why should we be forcing <coughs> victims to take any risk at all when the law says they should be entitled to uh, restitution? Okay. Um, I think Jordan Dial yeah. and Simon Durrell. On the standard adjustment rate, Mr Mason, um, there are actually two rates proposed in the bill. One uh, to reflect um, investment charges and tax and the second one to reflect um, other um, contingencies, if you like. And the suggestion <coughs> in the bill is 0.5%. Um, I think that's an area that the committee need to look at in more detail. Um, the um, information we've received is that, in fact, the investment charges and the tax costs could be anything between 0.5 up to maybe 1.5 or indeed 2%. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, we're probably not the people to give evidence on that aspect. You need to speak to financial experts, people who have experience of investing these sums and people who do this. Um, and I think suggestions have perhaps have already been made to the committee as to who might do that. Certainly I've seen one or two submissions from people who have that expertise. And certainly from, from April's point of view, I would urge you strongly to take evidence from these people. I mean, just on that specific point, would, you, would your feeling be that then we shouldn't have one rate for everybody, but we should, it should be more uh, flexible or more variable? That in, so the 0.5 might be for some people and 1.5 for someone else? No, I think the, the, the bill sets out this is to be a, um, a, a rate to be taken off whatever the portfolio has come up with. And of course, this is against the backdrop of the Scottish Minister having the power to issue regulations to set w what that rate is. And so I think you, you need to look at this as a whole and say, well, actually, how are the decisions being made? I think there needs to be transparency and accountability in terms of the Scottish Ministers coming to their decision in relation to how the portfolio should be set up um, and uh, what the rate should be set. And then the government actually, then he or she has to come to their decision. And again, you may want to look at the mechanism of that. Okay, Mr. Rowe, sorry, you want to yeah, no. Just to repeat what uh, Victoria had said, or to emphasise the importance of, it's important to understand that um, it, it doesn't, you can't say um, that because people are investing in uh, more risky investments in order to make their money last, that they're being, over, they're being overcompensated because the rate is fixed by, dis, by, by guilt. That's, it, if, you, if, you, if you understand what Victoria is saying, then it, it, that, that argument falls, falls away. It's um, what people do with their money. They, they, are, they have to invest in more risky investments in order to make their money last. If you've got a, a requirement to pay £100,000 a year for full-time care, uh, and you don't know how long you're going to live, and you have to anticipate wage rises in excess of the retail price index, and you may require a, an additional carer as you get older, um, and you don't know how long you're going to live. Uh, these are all factors and uncertainties that may require you to go beyond uh, investing in uh, index-linked index -linked government securities. Um, so you, you just that's and that's what's driven the behaviour of people. If perhaps if that's what they've done so far, if you could say to them, "We can certainly give you this amount of money, and that will last you for your entire needs," then any financial uh, advisor, you would think it, you're in the closed pension scheme type scenario, and you would expect to be told that you should invest in gilts in that situation. So. It's not a good argument to say that people are being overcompensated currently. It's, it's not correct. Well, I, if I can just come back on that, I mean, it, I do understand the argument. I'm not entirely stupid. 
Um, and uh, I think the, the point is that, yes, we can have a theoretical argument, but I don't think we can ignore what people have actually spent their money on and how they've invested it for whatever reason. And uh, if everybody, say, theoretically, had made a, a large profit and had a, a large lump sum left at the end, then that would suggest that there was overcompensation. Now, I'm not arguing that, but I'm just saying it's possible. I just have one other point, if, if I could ask specifically. Um, inflation's another factor in this, and the, uh, it suggested that the Retail Prices Index is used. Now, somebody, I think it was Professor Vass, perhaps, was mentioning wages inflation being much higher. So are we, uh, should there be a different use of inflation or a different uh, method of using inflation? I think it comes into the fact that this is a source of undercompensation for the claimant. If you're investing in, uh, if, if we're using ILGS as the benchmark, we don't have a choice about which inflation rate we're going to use because ILGS only are issued with indexed to the RPI. There are no uh, gilts that are indexed to the CPI or to earnings inflation. So it's one of the hits that the, is got, the, that the claimant has to bear is the fact that his or her lump sum is protects only against RPI inflation and not earnings inflation. Okay. Does, that make, does that make sense? Thank Can you. I just clarify that? Um, I think you need to distinguish between um, the award of damages and what might be regarded as an investment portfolio. <laughs> this is not an investment pot, it's not a reward, it's a sum of damages which is to look after somebody's needs for the rest of their life. And the point of the discount rate is used as a mechanism to calculate what that award of damages ought to be. Um, and I think that we need to be careful about how you assess behaviour thereafter. Yeah. And I think it's set out in the Scottish Government Policy Memorandum that they did not think it relevant that past investment behaviour be looked at and indeed the same applies into the future. Um, what a person does with their, 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 their damages can vary from case to case. And for the reasons expressed by Professor Ross, um, often there are shortfalls immediately that you would receive an award of damages. For example, uh, in serious cases, somebody may have to buy a new house, adapt it, buy equipment, and they may not have recovered the full extent of the money needed to pay for that for a number of reasons, some expressed by Mr. De Rolle earlier on. And so, um, the discount rate is there, you have the award of damages calculated at a certain point, but thereafter, how that is utilised, as I said, varies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just very briefly to conclude this point, because we, we, we refer, I think correctly, uh, to the, the, the very powerful contribution that Professor Voss has made, but there are two other what I would describe as uh, independent contributors to this process. There's a Personal Financial Planning Limited, there's the Institute of the Faculty of Actuaries. All three of those organisations are entirely clear that they do not recognise the concept of overcompensation and that they say that this bill should be drafted in a way that victims are entitled to no risk investment to achieve restitution. I don't think we should overlook that either. Right, thank you. And now questions from Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, con uh, convener. <clears throat> um, we've talked quite a bit about the question of overcompensation. I just wonder, from a sort of legal principle point of view, whether, in fact, once a case is settled in court, that there should be any consideration given to how that person may behave in the rest of their life. I mean, that's their private matter. So as a matter of legal principle, is it right that we, um, by implication, in fact, directly proposed in the bill, um, take account of their behaviour in the future? Or is there no legal principle concerned here? I think the only legal principle is that you put someone in the same position as they would have been but for the accident or the event, insofar as money can, but the court has no interest in what happens once the damages are awarded. Therefore. So that would that suggest that powerful legal principle, which is embodied in the bill, would suggest, therefore, that um, putting them in that position should not rely on them having to take risks on the performance of energy companies or Vodafone or anybody else, which are risks that are completely out with their control. That's right. Okay. Um, on a more fundamental question, because we're looking at the principles of this bill, um, 
I mean, given that, and you mentioned, <coughs> um, Mr. Durrell, the question of a, of a child in particular, um, given the uncertainties about the future of someone who's suffered a catastrophic uh, injury or, 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 or disease and faces huge uncertainties over the rest of their life, for the rest of their life, is it actually appropriate to award a lump sum in any case? Um, are, um, Thank you. Um, I think. Sorry, I, my, my fault. I should have said at the outset that the sound desk would deal with the microphones. There's no need to press any buttons at all. Thank so you. My apologies. That's all right, Mr. Dirolo. That's fine. Um, so the the, the 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 question is lump sums. There there, there is a place for lump sum uh, damages, and uh, we're. <laughs> In Scotland, until now, that's been the only method that a court uh, can uh, provide uh, for, uh, unless with the consent of both parties. And one of the good things about this uh, proposal in the bill is to, to allow the court to, to, to have a, a menu of options to allow uh, periodical payment orders. Um, there are disadvantages with periodical payment orders over lump sums, and I don't think you can say that lump sums are... Uh, one is necessarily um, better than the other. D it just depends on the individual case. Where there's a big dispute about life expectancy, a periodical payment order is, um, uh, you would think, a more appropriate way of, 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 of dealing with matters. But b for bo from both parties' point of view, uh, a, a lump sum is, is preferable in some, in some situations. Insurers like to have, they'll, they'll tell you, that they like to close their books they like to finish the case off. They don't want to have a future liability. They they don't they don't they want to buy off the risk, if you like, for them for themselves, and they, they would be prepared to, to do that. So, it, so so a lump sum suits uh, the defender often, um, uh, and equally, if if you go with, by way of a periodical payment, uh, um, you uh, for a pursuer there are uncertainties potentially there. So a lump sum can 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 assist. So I don't think it's a case of saying one superior to the other. It's important to have the ability to do uh, one or the other, depending on the circumstances of the case and the desires of the, of the parties. Just to pick up on that and to address the point specifically made, uh, Mr. Whiteman, um, following the passing of the Civil Education Expenses and Group Proceedings Act earlier this year, in the more serious cases, and particularly where future losses are over a million pounds, then there's an obligation for the pursuer side to obtain a report from an independent actuary to confirm whether or not a periodical payment order is the appropriate way to deal with that element of the um, of the damages claim, um, and that would be made available to the court in suitable in suitable cases, and then a decision would be made. Um, so there is a safeguard already in in the, in, in, the, in the extremely serious cases. So in in general terms, you, you would all welcome the greater flexibility at least in this bill, in terms of addressing, settling the future needs of people who've suffered damage. Yeah. Um, just on a very particular point, um, I think it was uh, Patrick Maguire, or maybe it wasn't, um, talked about different approaches north and south of the border. Um, does that matter if, for example, we have a different discount rate? And if it does matter, what might be the implications of that for, um, well, what might be the implications? I mean, could, could pursuers start to shop around for where they litigate? For my part, um, I don't think it matters terribly much um, in terms of having a different discount rate. We, we already have um, a, different levels of awards of damages in certain uh, aspects of our, 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 our procedure, and um, I don't think it's a, a, a major uh, reason for not approaching the matter for ourselves in a way which is... That, that, that we're, we're comfortable with, so I don't think I don't think that having a different discount rate is 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 a, is a major problem. Um, that that would be my um, view of of the matter. I don't know what others think. I, I, would, I would agree with that entirely. Um, I, I think more and more that we are seeing a divergence uh, between the two jurisdictions and various levels of compensation paid. Uh, that's because the two parliaments take different views on some fundamental issues. That, that, that can only be a good thing. Um, traditionally, even before we saw the divergence with some of the most recent acts, uh, there's always been differences, 
differences, for example, in Scotland in relation to awards for, for fatal damages, what, um, whether it's a matter of principle, uh, victims uh, in Scotland being compensated at a different, and dare we say, higher level than in England. Is that a problem? I don't see any particular problem of principle or policy there. Will it create uh, the thing that sometimes is talked about, forum shopping? Uh, that is becoming and has become far more difficult in recent years with some judgments of court. So I think that issue is pretty much now a non-issue, and it's therefore the question of pro policy and principle. Is it a problem for this parliament that our victims are compensated higher if that's appropriate? I hope the answer to that is no. And on the periodic payments, um, as I understand it, the court should only be able to require these where the defender was, um, where the organisation paying the compensation was reasonably secure. Does that um, risk some uh, cases where it would be appropriate to make an award of periodic payments, not getting that award, um, not bec it, it, purely because the defender is in a, a different position where, in fact, that would actually be the best solution for the pursuer. And if that's the case, should we not be looking at alternative mechanisms of making sure that there is um, security for that payment um, for everyone for whom that is suitable? Um, one of the main areas of concern is in relation to cases involving employers' liability insurance and also public liability insurance. Um, generally speaking, these policies have um, an indemnity limit of about £10 million. Now, that's sufficient for most lump sum cases, but particularly with a young pursuer, if, it, if the case was to be dealt with by a PPO, then that may create difficulties into the future. Um, and so I think that's something which we need to be looked at carefully but it would require a reassessment of putting obligations on employers and indeed other public bodies in relation to the levels of insurance cover. I mean, and what I'm kind of hinting at there is some kind of underlying state back guarantee scheme um, that would prevent people losing out on a periodic payment award You're where that was appropriate for yes. them, merely because, by some historic fluke or accident, uh, the defender well, wasn't in a position to... Well, be able to be reasonably secure. You already have that in motor cases because, um, um, and yes, I mean, it should be looked at to extend that into the employment, the employer's liability area. So, um, so what's already in motor cases? The, the, essentially a state back guarantee. Okay, thanks. It's on a slightly different issue, but I think it's you're, it, more broadly you're talking about the limits on PPOs. PPOs look like a really good idea, and you've raised the issue that security, lack of security is, is a constraint. Another constraint is that most cases don't go to court. Defenders, private defenders, don't like periodical payments because it's very expensive for them. Um, so all the cases that don't go to court, and because the, the defender is usually in the driving position in litigation, those cases will, will end up being as lump sums. And that's what happens. That's what, we, that's what we've noticed in England and Wales. When you've got a public defender, the periodical payments go through because that's what everybody... It's in, it's in everybody's interests. It's not in the interests of a general insurer to award damages um, under, under a PPO. There's information from one of the uh, submissions in, to the committee, um, we think, which is essentially PPOs in um, private insurer situations are about one quarter of the rate of PPOs used in NHS cases in England and Wales. Okay, thank you. Uh, move to Colin Beattie now. Thank you, Convener. Just to continue to look at uh, PPOs, um, generally speaking, is the panel, how does the panel view the provisions in the bill dealing with PPOs? As far as uh, the fancy is concerned, um, we, we, we um, have no real problem with the, the proposals in relation to PPOs. They look um, uh, reasonably um, sensible, and uh, they, 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 they're, they're, uh, strike the balance that's necessary um, in order to allow for um, people to come back <coughs> under very limited circumstances, but, uh, but they also deal with the, uh, the, the, the issue of security and, 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 and the rest. So um, the, the, the provisions look, um, from, from my perspective, uh, to be quite sensible. Do the rest of the panel agree? 
Just, just those, just those constraints that I that were raised before about the la uh, when you've got a lack of security and when you're not going to court defenders, uh, private defenders, not wanting uh, not wanting a PPO, and in the end they usually get their preference. But there seems to be some evidence given that several defender representatives have actually argued that pursuers prefer a lump sum award rather than a PPO. Is that your experience? Pursuers that would be advised by an IFA um, who had large care costs going forward, I think it's very unlikely that they would be advised to go for a lump sum. But yes, there will be some, and there will be some certain circumstances where a lump sum looks is better. But for large future, co future costs, PPO will be better, and, it, the, and the advice will be that it's better, because it you, those risks that are, and those shortfalls that I talked about at the beginning, you take out the risk of um, life expectancy, longevity, with a, with a periodical payment order, and you also take out inflation risk, earnings inflation, because very often care costs are linked to an earnings index, not a prices index. What, what would the, the reality is that, that uh, many private insurers also like lump sum payments because it provides certainty, it provides finality. And particularly in the higher value cases, not only do you have an insurer involved, you often have a reinsurer involved, and they like finality as well. So what would be the circumstances in, uh, in people's minds where pursuers prefer a lump sum? What would be the circumstances that would lead to that conclusion? Well, there might be uncertainty about the credit worthiness creditworthiness of the defender. So if it's not, a, it's not a public body, if there's a limitation, you, you, do, you would have to investigate how financially sound even the, the insurer is. If you're dealing with significant sums of money, you, you, you need to know um, who the insurer is, what sort of company you're dealing with. It may be you know, that some of them are registered in Gibraltar or they're registered somewhere else uh, and not in the UK. And um, concerns might be uh, 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 there might be concerns about um, uh, whether or not they're covered by the, the guarantee scheme under the financial services uh, provisions. So, so th th that's one example I'm just mm. giving that, that so you might have a concern over. A, you might say, well, I'd rather have a lump sum. The other thing about a lump sum is that there's no danger of anybody coming back ever. You don't, the litigation's finished. You don't have to deal with, with the other. With, there's, no, there's no possible prospect of any uh, argument in the future about whether you're still entitled to, to any, any sum of money. That, 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 that's a potential uh, concern that people might, might, might drive them towards a lump sum rather than a, than, a, than a periodical payment order. I don't think you can generalise about this very much. I think it's, it's a very individual mm. choice. What is important is that the court has the power, in, which it doesn't have at the moment in Scotland, uh, if one party says, I would like a periodical payment order to be imposed, the court can't do that because the other party doesn't agree. And the only thing a Scottish court can do at the moment is to award a lump sum in those circumstances. Now, these provisions change that, and that's a welcome change. In the case of PPOs, um, there's an implication that the pursuer, pursuer, presumably, would come back to court at some point to seek uh, some sort of revision of the terms that the payments made, or, or there would be some sort of a, a agreed trigger point, a cause which would result in going back to court. Who's, who's responsible for these court fees? If I might bring Mr. Maguire in first, I think yep. he's been wanting to get in then, Professor. Th Ross. Thank you. That, that, that was actually one of the points I raised uh, in my paper, um, I, and just to, to deal with the matter more generally as well. You, you ask. How do I feel about the way that, that the bill is currently drafted on this point? Um, I, I have two specific issues with the current drafting. Um, and perhaps before doing that, just to take the point generally you make about is it insurers or claimants who are most pro or anti uh, PPOs generally? Um, I think that properly advised. Um, the vast majority of pursuers in the most serious cases will see the benefit in PPOs. So I think the suggestion that they would run away and go for lump sums only w w would be rare subject to what's been said correctly about um, concerns about liquidity, etc. However, um, my concern is that the bill is currently drafted uh, creates a situation where a PPO could be forced on a victim. And I've got personal uh, experience uh, of, of acting uh, at the Scottish end 
of litigations where the claim has been raised uh, in England for jurisdiction reasons uh, and where a, a, a Scottish person has had a PPO forced upon them. Uh, and I know that that uh, occurrence of them not wanting a PPO, that them wanting uh, the choice for themselves to get a lump sum, but the court making that decision for them uh, can be a, a very, very difficult thing uh, for somebody when uh, they get to the very end of what is often uh, an extremely long road to compensation, uh, as these catastrophic injury cases inevitably are, uh, that the, the process of finally getting compensation is an empowering one ultimately and that in many ways they are disempowered by that decision being forced upon them. So uh, I, I personally would would caution against the situation uh, being created whereby it can be forced on uh, a victim. Uh, I would not necessarily say that is the case in terms of insurers, that um, if, a, if a victim wants a PPO then they ought to be able to argue that uh, and a court can make a decision irrespective of uh, an insurer's view. Um, coming to your point about um, the reviews of the PPO rates, it could be either way. You, you indicate that it that may be a victim who realises they're falling short and that they're looking for more. It's entirely possible that an insurer may think that circumstances have changed, the person's got better and it should be reduced. Uh, I think uh, you've, you've highlighted a very important point that that will involve a court process that we now live uh, in the post quarks world, qualified one-way cost shifting, uh, and that as far as I'm concerned, those principles of qualified one-way cost shifting should apply to these further court processes uh, in relation to PPOs, and, and that um, the victims should uh, have their cost shifting protected irrespective of the outcome of that, and I think that's missing from the bill. So you feel there's, a, there's an exposure there at the moment? The, 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 as the bill was currently drafted, there could be, yes. Just an extension that. of that. What happens with the, with the pursuers who lack mental capacity? How are they handled? They would require a guardian uh, appointed on their behalf or to, to represent them and to take decisions for them. And the, and the guardian would, uh, would sign off on the compensation package? Know, as to whether it's a lump sum or a PPO. Yeah. Who appoints the guardians? The courts? You make an application to yeah. the court and the court, support, the court uh, appoints the guardian, yes. Yeah. It's done in a different process. It's, done not, it's not done in the personal injury action. It's done uh, in another process in the sheriff mm -hmm. court, actually. Right. Well, um, thank you very much to our panel. We've run slightly over our time, but uh, thank you very much for coming in today and your contributions to this uh, matter. Thank you. I'll suspend the meeting now and move into private session.